All righty. Good afternoon again, everyone. Welcome to today's training. Uh, before I begin officially, go ahead and give me some sort of visual indicator, a thumbs up or a nod that you can hear me okay and also see my screen share. Awesome. Great. Cool. Well, welcome. My name is Monica Olson. I'm the Accessibility Policy Associate um, here at the State Board. I'm just almost at my year mark. Um, prior to that, I was the director for Student Accommodation Office at one of our uh, CTC colleges. And um, you're here today to spend a couple of hours together learning about Web Accessibility 101 with myself and my co-presenters. So I'll move on to the next slide. And again, I've just introduced myself. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Marilyn, to introduce herself as well. Hello and happy GAD day. Um, my name is Marilyn Varela. I'm the website administrator, which means I support the external website and intranet. And part of my job duties are testing uh, web applications for accessibility. Thank you. Hello, my name is, oh yeah. Hello, my name is Greg Gamble. Um, I'm a programmer here at the State Board, and I do the majority of the websites that are used by the State Board and the Peoples. And I'm going to be showing some technical stuff for you. And Sean. And I'm Sean Higney. I'm a program specialist um, at Spokane Falls Community College. Uh, there I do, I work with disability and disability access service, specifically intakes for students who are heavily visually impaired or have cognitive impairment. I'm also responsible for all the technology for our office. And I also do textbook remediation and document correction. And I'm here just to help out and provide you all with a screen reader demo. Thanks, Sean. Um, okay, so today's uh, training is just about two hours long. We have divided it into four distinct sections. Section one will be presented by myself. I'm going to provide us um, a working definition and intro to the concept of web accessibility, uh, definition and examples of disability and assistive technology and the legal landscape that we all should be aware of as state agency employees. Section two will be presented by Marilyn. She's gonna go more in depth about WACAG, technical standards and core. Um, and she's also gonna log into Omni and give a site demo. Section three will be presented by our guest presenter, Sean. He's gonna talk a little bit more about screen reader technology specifically and provide you with a live demo. Section four, last but not least, will be presented by Greg Gamble. This is perhaps the most technical section of our presentation and is specifically geared to the web developers in the room today. Before we um, launch into the actual content, I do want to mention a few housekeeping items. We are recording today's training. Professional live captioning is provided. If you need to follow along for access, um, please hit the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you don't see the CC button, you might see um, on the right-hand side three uh, the three dot ellipses. You can press that and um, there should be a, a menu with several options and show live transcript, I believe is the option that you want to press to see caption. We do have a short uh, five minute break scheduled after part two or section two of today's training. Um, and you should have received an email with links to all of our presen presentation materials today, including the slide deck materials and resources. Um, I can work to put that in the chat here in a few moments, uh, in a few moments as well. Okay. Section one is intro to web accessibility. And um, forgive me, I'm gonna minimize my screen just for a second to make sure I can put a link in the chat that might be helpful to you all and then we'll get right back to it. Okie doke. So right now what I'm copying and pasting is a Google doc with um, all of our materials, links and resources. <clears throat> If I can find the chat, here it is. Okay, that's coming at you. 
The second um, Google Doc that I'm going to put into the chat is a little blog post that I wrote and recently published internally for State Board staff around GAD, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which is today. So you all are doing a good job celebrating by being here. So here's a link to that post. Now we're going to go ahead and navigate back to our PowerPoint presentation. Can you guys still see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so before we jump into the more technical components of our training today, we all need to have a common working understanding of web accessibility and what it is. Monica, so, sorry, yeah. to interrupt. Um, we wanted to talk about questions before we got too far. Oh, thanks for interrupting me, Sean. So um, we, we might be a little pressed for time uh, during today's training. So uh, we will be moderating the chat for questions. And we hope that at the end of each specific section, that presenter will be able to take between one and three questions. If there's a really urgent question in the chat, whoever's moderating the chat will let the presenter know. Thanks, Sean. Okay. Moving on, so what is web accessibility or digital accessibility and what does it have to do with disability and including people with disabilities? We can talk about it in a lot of different ways. Broadly speaking, what it means is that websites, apps, and digital tools and content are designed intentionally and developed intentionally so that people with disabilities who use assistive technology to control their computers and navigate the web can use all of these things equitably and as independently as possible. Specifically, what this means is that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with web content. It also means that there are accessible avenues for people with disabilities to contribute to the web and create their own web content. What does accessible mean? Um, the definition that I've chosen to share with you today comes um, from the Office for Civil Rights, or OCR. Uh, back in 2014, they were involved in an investigation with the University of Montana looking into some um, complaints around possible disability discrimination that was reported by several students at the university who were um, uh, having trouble accessing their alternate format materials for their classrooms in time within a reasonable time frame. And from this resolution, we now have a very strong working definition of accessible that we can lean on, which means that individuals with disabilities are able to independently acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions and enjoy the same services within the same time frame as individuals without disabilities or non-disabled people with substantially equivalent ease of use. Now I'd like to take an opportunity to show you a four minute video. It is Introduction to Web Accessibility and W3C Standards. It's produced by the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative W3C stands for World Wide Web Consortium. So let me pull up that video that I've preloaded and then we'll move on. Um, and then please, one of the other co-presenters, please uh, interrupt me if the audio is not working well in this video. Okay, here we go. Hi. My name is Shadia Bouzar. I'm the Accessibility Strategy and Technology Specialist at W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. And today, I'd like to tell you about web accessibility. The web is for many people an essential part of daily life, at work, at home, and on the road. Web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web equally. For example, somebody who cannot use their arms and uses a mouse stick to type, or someone who cannot hear well and uses captions to watch videos, or someone who cannot see well and uses a screen reader to read aloud what's on the screen. Accessibility has many benefits. For example, captions benefit anyone 
in a loud or in a quiet environment. And good color contrast works better when there's glare. Also people with age-related impairments, such as reduced dexterity, benefit. In fact, everyone has a better user experience with an improved layout and design. A lot of accessibility can be built into the underlying code of websites and applications. Web technologies from W3C, such as HTML, provide support for many accessibility features. For example, features to provide text alternatives for images, which are read aloud by screen readers and also used by search engines. Also headings, labels, and other code supports accessibility and improves the quality overall. Good authoring tools, such as wikis, content management systems, and code editors, help create accessible code, either automatically or with input from the author. Also web browsers, media players, and apps need to support accessibility features. W3C provides standards to help make the web accessible, which are internationally recognized by governments and businesses. Most well known is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG. WCAG is also ISO standard 4500 and adopted in the European standard called EN 301549. It is built around four core principles. First, perceivable. For example, so people can see the content or hear it. Operable, for example, so people can use the computer by typing or by voice. Understandable, for example, so people get clear and simple language. And robust, so people can use different assistive technologies. Besides WCAG, W3C also provides the Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines, ATAG, which defines requirements for content management systems, code editors, and other software. And the User Agent Accessibility Guidelines, UAAG, defines requirements for web browsers and media players. There are over 1 billion people with disabilities, or around 15 to 20% of the population. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities defines access to information, including the web, as a human right. Most countries around the world have ratified this UN Convention, and several have adopted binding policies too. Yet regardless of any laws and regulations, implementing the accessibility standards is essential for people with disabilities and useful for all. For more information on web accessibility, visit w3.org slash WAI. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching that video with me. I really appreciated the um, the sharing the fact that between 50 and 20 percent of our world population are people with disabilities so it really is a good business to to pay attention to accessibility and web accessibility in particular so we'll go ahead and move on so um, that video was produced by the w3c way or web accessibility initiative and this group is the group that's responsible for developing the internationally recognized technical guidelines and web accessibility standards we in shorthand um, in the accessibility world refer to those guidelines as wcag or wcag 2.1 aa uh, WACAG 2.1 AA are also the technical standards that are referenced in Washington State's um, web accessibility and IT accessibility policy, which we refer to as policy 188. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. And Marilyn's going to go a little bit deeper into WACAG during her section as well. What is a disability? I've chosen to provide you with a working 
legal definition of disability that is um, given to us by the ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990 and then amended in the early mid 2000s to um, expand the scope of disability that this um, federal law covers. Um, so as I present this definition to you, I also want you to think about your own personal experiences with, with disability, whether those, those might be your own experiences, whether you know you have friends and family members that have physical or mental health disabilities, or you know that you work with some colleagues that identify as um, someone with a disability, think through those experiences and how those people might benefit from universal design and web accessibility principles. So the ADA defines disability as this, a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. Now we can think about major life activities and certainly the law does in terms of things like cooking for oneself, bathing, personal care, that type of thing. But the ADA also recognizes learning and concentration or focus as a major life activity which those things could very well be impacted by a number of different disabilities or impairments. This definition also include, includes people who have a record of having such an impairment. Um, and it also includes individuals who maybe do not have a disability um, or perhaps are not considered to have a disability by their medical professions, professionals per se, but are regarded by society as having a disability. So those people would benefit from the protections of the ADA as well. This next slide is titled Disability in the Web. And I'm gonna explain the picture or graphic that I've chosen to include here in, in a minute. Um, the web accessibility standards that we're gonna learn about here, WACAG 2.1 AA, those standards or guidelines that the WAY group have worked to write and develop strive to encompass all different types of disability experiences that might be affected by interacting with web content. And so today we can think about four main categories of disability. In the visual category of disability, we might think about people who have low vision, that they have some vision. So perhaps those people use screen magnification software to enlarge the content on their computer so they can see the content. We might think about people who are completely blind and rely on screen readers to navigate web content and control their computers and people who are colorblind. Auditory as a category of disability might include people who are fully deaf or partially deaf and hard of hearing it also could include people who have auditory processing disorders. Motor as a main category of disability might include people who have um, limited fine motor skill or control. That would include me. I'm in this category. I experience a disability called CP or cerebral palsy that affects the left side of my body. Um, and so I can't do things like turn a doorknob, pick up a, a cup of coffee or type on my keyboard with my left hand at all. I use a special keyboard that allows me to type only with my right hand. Um, but some people might not be able to uh, use a mouse at all if they don't have any upper body mobility. So they might use voice control software to navigate the web and control their computers. Cognitive as a category, could include people with learning disabilities, uh, focus and attention disabilities, such as ADHD, um, and people who struggle to you know, uh, focus or take in large chunks of information at one time. So we might think about blocks of text that are not appropriately sectioned in, um, in different heading, level, he heading levels on a web page. That might be hard for someone to take in and navigate. So now we're going to move on and spend a little bit of time reviewing the legal landscape as it, as it pertains to disability civil rights and IT or web accessibility. I don't expect you all to become ADA or 504 experts by the end of this presentation. We're certainly not going to quiz you on it, but I do think that as a group, when we think about the content we're creating and putting out there for our colleagues, our students, etc in our system to use and engage with that we do want to be mindful of the legal landscape. So first I'll talk a little bit about 
two federal laws, the ADA I mentioned earlier, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which was passed in the 70s. And Section 504 was the first civil rights um, federal law to protect the uh, rights of people with disabilities passed ever in the, in the US. So it's, it's really important part of our history. These federal laws work together to um, make sure that people cannot, people with disabilities, excuse me, cannot be denied services or program access due to their disability. Uh, people with disabilities are entitled to use appropriate accommodations. So if someone needs a specific accommodation to access an event or a classroom activity, they're entitled to use that accommodation. It also ensures, these laws also ensure that people with disabilities have access to material of the same quality or rigor and, and within the same time frame or reasonable time frame as that of non-disabled people or people without disabilities. We also wanna know a little bit about section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. This law specifically requires that all, um, excuse me, I'm gonna let someone into the weight room. This requires that all um, federal electronic and IT um, information is to be designed accessibly to people with disabilities and that is the public as well as federal employees. There was a section 508 refresh that took place not too long ago in 2017. You can learn more about that by navigating to this hyperlink that I've provided in the slide deck. I think the, the biggest takeaway around Section 508 of the Rehab Act that I want you all to understand today is that um, the refresh has a specific focus on functional technical accessibility. I'm missing a word on the screen there, I'm realizing. And it also aligns, it did a lot of work, the refresh did a lot of work to align specifically with WCAG standards, which is important because Washington State, the state that we all work in, um, has a policy called Policy 188. And this policy states that all Washington State agencies must meet minimum IT technical accessibility standards. And they're referring to WCAG 2.1 AA. The policy explains to us that the procurement development and implementation of things such as instructional, administrative, or communication technologies and content must be accessible. So this includes things like college websites or the state board website. It includes things like our learning management tools and systems, student information management systems, training materials. So if we're creating training materials that are going to be available system-wide on how to do or use something, we need to be thinking about how to develop those materials accessible in an accessible way to people of all different abilities and disabilities and assessment tools. Okay, I know I'm going a little bit fast. You all are doing great um, staying with me here. We're gonna now move away from the uh, legal landscape and I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to AT or assistive technology. You're gonna explore this a bit more with Sean in section three. Broadly speaking, AT is, can be hardware and or software. It can be low tech or high tech. And these are tools that help people with disabilities complete a task um, as independently as possible. So this might include things like screen meters for people who are blind, but it also could include things like voice command or voice control software, such as Dragon Naturally Speaking, if someone cannot use a keyboard or mouse at all. It could include someone who uses a mouth stick to control their computer. And it could also include people such as myself who use adaptive keyboards or computer mice to operate their computer. The image that I've included on the screen today is of a person who is sitting in their wheelchair um, at their desk and they are using a mouth stick that's connected to their iPad to help them control and operate the iPad. That concludes section one, y'all. Thank you so much for giving me your time and attention. I'm gonna hand it over to Marilyn now. Oh, actually, I do have time to take two questions. So are there any questions for me about section one, intro to web accessibility?
Don't be shy. And there's no silly questions. There's no wrong questions. Okay, that's okay. Um, we will provide our contact. We do have our contact information um, in, in one of those Google Docs. So if you think of questions later on, or you want to chat more about web accessibility with me, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, with that, thanks again, y'all. And I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn. Okay, thanks for hanging in here with us. Um, if you make it through this section with me we'll give you a short break as your reward um, this part of the training is going to cover accessibility standards and our web that our website must validate against we will cover what the standard is how we know if we meet it and what we can do to make our web pages more accessible for everyone to make our web content accessible we need to understand our users and how they consume our content we must be aware of the roadblocks we may create and how that affects them. The illustration that's on your screen shows that one, one size does not fit all. A standard bike does not work for someone in a wheelchair or for tall or small people. By making modifications to the bike, it works for everyone. We can do this with our web content as well. We need to be aware of our users and what their needs are in order to provide content that works for them. Next slide. The standard we hold our web content to is WCAG 2.1 AA. WCAG stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. The current specification is 2.1 and we adhere to level AA, which is a medium target. A is low and AAA is high. AAA is almost impossible to achieve. AA includes all of A as well. To understand if our site meets this specification, we need to check for POR. POR stands for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. What exactly does that mean? Let's look at some examples. Perceivable. Perceivable means that someone can hear, see, or touch your content. In order to be perceivable, your pages should provide text alternatives for non-text content like charts and graphs, alt tags for images, captions for videos, and include an audio description of what is happening in a video like an on-screen text, characters, actions, scene changes, etc. Operable. Thank you, Monica. Can, I, can't, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time, so Monica's driving for me here. Can someone interact with your site? Is there an alternative way to fill out forms or control a video? An accessible site should allow for the ability to input information in form fields through a keyboard or mouth stick. This includes Word documents, Google documents, and PDFs. Tab items in the correct order. Keyboard users should be able to tab through interactive elements in the correct order, and I'll show a demo of this later. Headings should describe topic or purpose. Touch targets should be big enough for large or impaired fingers. Understandable. Is your content understandable by someone with a cognitive disability or someone who speaks English as a second language? We know writing for the web is different than other types of writing. You already know how to use plain language, bullets, and white space. Summaries and illustrations can also help users grasp content meaning quickly and meaningfully. Things to check for include the site functionality should be easy to navigate. Links should be obvious and indicate where they will take the user. Form controls must be labeled. Greg will cover that later. Navigation must be consistent and predictable, robust. Does your web content work on all types of devices and older browsers? Do you have large images that take time to download on a mobile device? Does your content change size to fit the user's screen or do they have to scroll? If we build websites according to WCAG standards and we use valid HTML and ARIA, which stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications, 
they should provide a robust experience for all of our users. ARIA is a set of attributes that define ways to make web content and web applications, especially those developed with JavaScript, more accessible to people with disabilities. Robust criteria are accomplished through the coding of websites and applications, which Greg will cover more in depth in his segment. Items that pertain to page managers are a telephone number input field in three parts must announce all three parts, the area code, the prefix, and the suffix. Use button HTML code, not a div or a span tag. Now we're going to talk about semantic HTML, starting with heading structure. Heading structure is important for those using assist, assist, assistive devices or not. When using headings, keep it simple. Do not skip heading levels. List headings in the correct order. Think of headings like a nested list or sub items. There should only be one H1 on a page. In this illustration here, it shows subcategories under main categories. So a level two is the main category and heading level three through six are subcategories that should be in the correct order under the main category. Alt text. When using image alt text, it should not include a picture of or image of. Screen readers automatically announce an image as an image. So an alternative text image of an apple would be read aloud by a screen reader as image, image of an apple. When using alt text, we need to use correct grammar, such as capitalizing the first letter and ending whole sentences with a period. There's a link here and in your handout to that goes further into how to write good alt text. Hyperlinks. No more click here. Descriptive hyper, our hyperlinks need to be descriptive. Click here and read more. Do not tell a screen reader user if the link is worth clicking on because they don't know where it will go. Since screen readers can read all the links at once, click here is useless and many clicks, click here's are annoying. Sean will demonstrate this in his section. Color and tables. To achieve good color contrast, crap, contrast, use approved color themes from communications. The link is in your handout materials and on this slide. The guide is on StaffNet. This applies to Word documents, PDFs, and presentations as well. Templates for these documents, which are accessible, are also on StaffNet in the same area. Don't use tables for layout. Tables are for data. Use simple table structure or mark up complex tables correctly, making sure the headings are correct. So now that we've gone over that, let's see these concepts in action. In this demo, we're going to, oops, can you back that up a second, Monica? Oh, did, yes. I, I stopped my screen share too early. I was trying to give you control. Okay, we're back. So in our demo, we're going to check for accessibility on your pages or how to check for that, how to use styles for tables, how to set header rows for tables, and um, how to fix broken, identify and fix broken accordions. And then I'm also going to show you tab order on a form. Okay. Okay. Are you ready to take over control now? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop my share. There you go. And as Marilyn's pulling up her screen share and she's walking through a live demo with us, I can help moderate the chat in case there's an urgent question that needs to come through. Okay. Can you see the screen okay? I can see the Omni CMS. Okay, thank you. Sounded like Christopher, appreciate that. That's me. All right, so in order to check our page for accessibility, it needs to be checked out. 
and then you go to page check. And I would encourage everyone who is a page um, manager to run this before you submit your page for publication. It will tell you if you have spelling errors, broken links. But what we're going to look at today is W3C valid errors. And this is telling us that this beautiful page that I created for Sean for a demo is totally broken on purpose. And that it doesn't have, it's missing an alt tag and it's missing it on this um, image. We also have some accessibility problems such as our headings are not in the right order. We have text that doesn't have a good enough color contrast in order to be accessible. We're, and again, we're missing an alt tag. And we have a suspicious link text. Uh, click here. Read more should also pop up there. And then I want to talk real quick about the color contrast of text. Um, this will tell you it should be 4.5 to 1, or for large text, 3 to 1. And the first number is the luminance of light colors relative to the second number, which is the luminance of dark colors. So now that we know what our problems are, let's go fix them. Okay, so this looks like a header, but it's marked up as a paragraph. And so it's not a header. It should be a header too, which means that a screen reader would totally miss the content because somebody who's navigating their screen with headers is going to not get that because it's marked up as a P instead of a header. Our next header on the page is an H1. There should only be one H1 on the page. And the pages all have the H1 as the title right here. So we know that we can't have an H1 down here. So this right here should be an H2. And I'm not going to actually fix them because then Sean's demonstration won't work. But I think you guys all know how to fix that. The next issue we have is a table that doesn't have any um, headers. So a screen reader would not be able to associate the columns with the cells. So to fix that, do a right mouse click go to row, row properties, and change this from body to header. And here again, I'm not going to do that because then it will work. And then we need to check our click here link needs to have a better description. And then for our other issues in our other column, we have text that is um, not sufficient contrast. So to fix the text, you would go to StaffNet and get the approved color palette and then pick the color and you can put in the RGB or the hex uh, value for that color, which is in the guide on StaffNet. The next problem we had was an image that did not have alt text. So we would need to put descriptive alt text in here that basically explains what the what this image is portraying. Then the other thing I want to show you is right here we have some red text it says don't close this window until you are finished and then we have a green check and a red check so i'm going to no 
no, I don't want to save my changes. Thank you. Okay, so in order to to um, check colors on our website, you would press Control Shift I on my Windows machine, which brings up your developer toolbar here, and we want to go to accessibility. That little window is like right over there, and then we want to pick simulate. We're going to go with the no red. So this will show us what our website looks like to someone who doesn't see red. And that text that I told you about right down here that says don't close window until you're finished is not going to stand out to somebody who can't see red. If you use color to indicate progress on a web page or it's somebody who can't see red or green is not going to see the difference in your color. So you need to use another way of to indicate that. And then for no green, this is what the site looks like to people that don't see green. So here again, that red text doesn't, doesn't stand out and the check marks don't stand out. So now um, we talked about tabbing. So somebody should be able to tab through our page. We have this nice little skip to content uh, on our on all of our pages, which is an accessibility feature. So basically, somebody should be able to use a keyboard and get through our page and be able to interact with it. So these tabs should all be in the, in the correct order. And when you get to a form, you should be able to use your down arrow and your enter key to tab through the form and the fields should be in the correct order. And then um, you should be able to submit the form with the enter key. All right, now I'm going to go back and show you uh, the accordions real quick. So one of the things that I've noticed a lot um, when I publish content is that we have issues with our accordions and they're not terribly user friendly. So if we run our page check on this page, it will tell us that we have a problem. Uh, we don't care about that. We might about that one. But this is the one I'm looking for. So um, this is telling us that we have the ID accordion one being used twice on this page. And you can only have one ID. The ID on a page has to be unique. So I want to show you what that does. We have two accordions here, the first one and the second one. Since the idea is the same on both of them, the first one works. The second one does not. If you have an accordion that's broken, you have a pretty good idea that maybe there's something wrong with the accessibility on it. So in order to fix this, all we have to do is go into our, our accordion and find the name of the section. So there's accordion one there and there's accordion one there. So if we change this to accordion two, and I'd recommend that you give these a little bit better descriptive names, but you don't have to. We're gonna save that. And now when we go preview it, This one works. And this one works. And we shouldn't get that error anymore. So we still have an error, but not that one. So that is all I had um, for my section. 
Thank you so much, Marilyn. That was great. I'll go ahead and screen share again. Um, in the slide deck here, Marilyn's included a list of uh, references and resources you all can refer to as you'd like. And we do have time for Marilyn to take a couple of questions. I know this is a lot of really good information to be soaking in, so you might all still be processing, but if there's any question out there, especially from our web content managers, our page editors, feel free to ask away. Monica? Yes. I'd also just like to say that if someone has a page that they're struggling with or they have um, there's items on it that they don't really understand, that if they don't want to bring it here, that they can send me an email and I can work with them on that also. Thank you for the offer, Marilyn. So as you're uh, editing your pages and doing your W3C and accessibility checks, and you're, if you're not sure how to fix an issue, go, you can send Marilyn a private email. I've done that myself. There are error messages that I receive that I don't understand as I'm not a trained web developer myself. And um, so I still need to reach out and ask clarifying questions of my colleagues and get some support too. We're all in this together. So if there aren't any questions, and let me go ahead and um, make sure there's nothing in the chat that I've missed. Nope. Um, we'll go ahead and take a five or six minute break now. Um, so feel free to get a cup of coffee, go to the bathroom, do whatever you need to do. And we'll be back in our seats at 1.55 and ready to start again with Sean at 1.56. See you soon.
all. Um, I hope you all are back in your seats. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our guest presenter and colleague, Sean, who's going to um, talk a little bit about screen readers with you and provide a demo. Okay, so we're now in section three with Sean. Um, can you all still see my screen here? I hope you can. Okay, thanks for the thumbs up, Nanette. Um, so if you all, you have this in the Google Doc I sent to you in the chat. If you wanna pull up those demo pages that Marilyn created, you're welcome to do so and follow along that way. Um, so we have an accessible or good page URL link, as well as an inaccessible or bad page URL link. Um, and then I've also include, included a link to DQ University's NVDA screen reader keyboard commands in case you leave here inspired to download that free screen reader and explore yourselves. Um, all righty, Sean. So I've got the screen reader basics uh, screen up and viewable for everyone now. Thank you, Monica. Uh, hello again, everyone. My name is Sean. Um, as a reminder, um, I'm going to be giving you a demo and talking about talking about what it feels like to use a screen reader as a user in hopes that it gives you more perspective on why this is so important. Um, just to give a little background, um, I am actually a part-time screen reader user. I mostly use magnification, uh, such as, such as um, Windows Magnifier or Zoom Text. So there are other programs, and other AT out there that people use to access the computer. We're just looking at one variety right here. So what is a screen reader? A screen reader is basically a piece of software that someone with low vision or no vision uses to navigate and interact with their computer. The goal is to have independent interaction and operation of the computer. So someone shouldn't have to say, can you come sit here and help me with this? They should be able to fully interact on anything else someone else without a screen reader could do or could could use. Um, so you're gonna see two, two different sets of screen readers, first party and third party. First party is something like um, Microsoft Narrator for Windows or VoiceOver for iOS and Mac. Um, those tend to be built into the operating system. You also see another example would be TalkBack on Android uh, Linux also has its own version. Um, some screen readers are third party, such as JAWS and NVDA. They're made by independent companies. Um, some, some AT, such as JAWS, is uh, purchase only. So um, they have, need to have, have a description or you have to buy a license outright. Uh, NVDA, which is the product we're going to be demoing today, is free and you can download it, as Monica mentioned. Um, NVDA is Windows only, just to be aware. So now I'm going to um, share my screen and I'll get us set up on the good page. And then we'll kind of walk through that page together. Uh, I'll try to explain what you should be seeing, what you are hearing. Um, as a reminder, for anybody who hasn't seen the screen reader, you're going to hear a lot of feedback, a lot of talk back from a computer voice to you. Um, the more experienced a screen reader user is, the less feedback they need. But I'm only a part-time user. Um, I need a little more feedback. Um, it is a little uncomfortable, a little weird. Please just kind of hang in there because it's it's uncomfortable and a little weird to use one as a user. Um, so we'll start with a good page and then move on to the band page. And then I'll have some time for questions for you at the end. NV app real SBCTC trainings. Mike, is everybody getting? Can you hear the audio come through? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Okay, so this is our good page, um, and so I'm just gonna. What we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through the page using major landmarks. So first, we're gonna try headings. Uh, then we'll try lists, um, then tables, and then graphics. So I'm going to kind of just walk us through the, um, the page. Just to note, um, you may not follow along exactly with what um, the image may not follow exactly what is being said. That's partly a limitation on 
um, NVDA not falling exactly perfectly. And I'm using a little bit of magnification so I can see the screen. Um, but I'll try to call out and make sense of what you're hearing. Um, and you're going to want to notice on this page that you hear things that make sense, um, should be reasonably navigable just by ear. And then um, you can hear the difference when we hit the bad page. So we're, we're just going to try to navigate by headings. No next heading. Okay, hold on. So that's something else that sometimes happens. You get you get kind of stuck in the wrong spot in a page. That's kind of unfortunate re reality of screen reader. You just have to kind of work to get back into where you want to go. Skip to navigate A to Z, college, contact, search, and click to list with seven, paying for college. A main landmark, the A to Z index is where you'll history frame, history grouping, access. <laughs> See if it'll let us do it again. Grants and allocations available for application heading level two. Okay, so it did skip heading level one. It is correct. It is there. What you saw that little air weirdness was just sometimes the screen reader is not focusing where I want it to. Um, that's kind of the reality of using a screen reader sometimes. Um, so you, you kind of you kind of bounce in and out of focusable elements. As I said, we're going to be moving down header, header by header. So those are the main anchor points on the page. A long list of links heading level two. Commissions and councils heading level three. Colors heading level two. This image has descriptive text that conveys what is in the image and doesn't say image of. Uh, we'll come back to that image in a second, but as I'm, as you can see or hear, excuse me, um, you should be able to kind of remember where you are relatively well. Um, the tags are correct and that they're going down uh, the page. They decrease, they, decre they uh, increase, so H2, H3. Uh, just leave it like an outline. If it makes sense, that's a good, that's a good start. Color should not portray important information. No next heading. Okay, so I've reached the end of the headings and then we'll uh, skip back up to do lists and information in a list. Verla are off, job, sir, privacy, non, act, well, get, terms of use, Browser tabs toolbar, navig, no track, comp, saved, bookmarks to accessibility. That's another good thing I was going to point out. If you can navigate by a tab through your page, that's a good sign. That means that your tab order, that your order is reasonable. So if you ever wonder, I just want to get a quick sanity check, just run through your page by using tab key only. Um, now we're going to look at lists. So lists should give me a Indication of what the name is, how many items are in the list, and then it should give me a um, a, a, a chance. To David get Kaufman. No next. Skip to net eight college content. Click to search book. Apply about main landmark the A to Z. list with nine items. Bullet Washington Association of Community and Technical Colleges. Waxy. Okay, so now I can also down, go down into the list. List with one items white bullet president's assistance for community and technical colleges, PACSI. Bullet business affairs link commission, BAC, link list white bullet budget accounting and reporting council, BAR, link white bullet operations and facilities council, OFC, link white bullet budget accounting and report list with list with seven items white bullet. So, so, so what happens is, um, you also can notice that we have good we have good naming on the list here. They're all um, they're not read here or click for more or the long address form address of a page. I can understand where I'm going, what what I'm looking for, especially in a list is technical. That's really important because if you just these all said say for example click here read more, what am I even going to start? And then you know the user will kind of just basically not interact with anything. List with one item, list with eight items, white bullet advice, no next list. Okay, so we've reached the end of the list. Um, Public information, remote control, club, meeting, con meeting, more, show desk, bullet, um, mute, audio set, start, more options, meeting control has been docked to the bottom alert, access. So uh, we also want to talk about the idea of alternate text. Um, 
if you mention an image in the website or it's relevant, you definitely want to describe it. As you heard, as we went through headings, there was an image uh, mentioned through in passing. So we're going to come over back to that image as an example. Sit closed. Open app. Image, can, image HUEG logo has the outline of a graduation cap in orange above the navy blue HUEG text in all uppercase with sentence case text below that which reads higher education user group. That's good alt text. It's short. It's clear. Um, you may some sometimes you may skip something like this as a grad as a logo, but since you mention it specifically in the page, you want to make sure. Okay, I've used alt text that's clear and concise. So now we're going to move on to the bad page, which should contrast pretty strongly with this one. Um, be less logical, harder to follow. Uh, this is Monica. Sorry for my interruption. Before you move on to the bad page, um, could you show us table navigation? I'm yes, not thank you. I totally space tables. Do. Thank you, thank you Monica. <laughs> application. Edit cursor. No next table. Create navigation, no track, con, 100, save, skip to content link, nap, A to Z. list with six. A, about main landmark, the A to Z. table with six rows and four columns, row one, column one application. Okay, like Monica mentioned, we also want to talk about tables. As you notice, um, we had a clear understanding of how many rows, how many columns. This is an applications table. Um, this is super important if you have a table to make sure you, monitor, you uh, mark it up correctly. Because if I was a visually, you know, no, had no vision as a user, I would never know where I'm going to be at in the table if it's not marked up correctly. So I'm just going to kind of move you around in the table and you can kind of just listen to what that sounds like. Row two link high demand. Row three link Perkins leadership block grant. Release date column two, April 15th, 2021. Due date column three continuous through May 31st. Final report due column four July 31st. Due date column three 2022. 31. Final report due column row four application column one link Perkins non traditional gender employment and training grant. So as you can see, when I'm moving through the, applic uh, the application table, I know what, um, what, what, what column I am, what row I'm in. Um, I know what they, why the information is relevant. So we have, you know, you, here it will play out. They'll say out application, release date, due date. Um, without that, I'm just getting a bunch of information that doesn't make any sense. So we'll contrast this with the bad page, which should be, like I said, a lot less logical and a lot more um, frustrating. So just give me one second and we'll move on. The to A to Z, North Accessibility Dem Act Web Washington State Board for. Okay. So. Uh, we're just going to try to go through again, again, through headings, lists, tables, and graphics, and we'll just see what happens. Main landmark accessibility demo bad page heading level one. Okay, so so far we're okay because this is the title heading, that's fine. Programs and services heading level two. Again, that makes sense because that's following. You only have one H1 and one. Um, from there on out, you would be H2, H3, and so on. Grants and allocations available for application heading level one. Okay, and that's confusing. Now I'm thinking, is this the actual title of the page? Is this what I'm supposed to be reading the title? Um, if I had no vision, I don't know where I'm at now. I could did I did I get pushed back to the top? Um, am I in the wrong window? What's going on? A long list of links heading level four. Okay, now I'm really confused because I don't know where H2 and H3 went. So am I now in a list? Um, did I said did I get to go to the wrong page? Um, so now the user has to either start over again or um, just kind of hope they figure out where they're going because uh, otherwise there's no no logical flow to this page. Commissions and councils heading level two. Colors heading level two. This image needs descriptive alt text, not just something that says H-E-U-G logo. Heading level three. So that's technically correct, but because of the 
uh, the other parts on the page, I'm still not sure. Am I getting, you know, am I in the right spot? Am I in the right, am I missing something? Color should not port, no next heading. So this is an important, again, a reminder, headers are important. Because someone without vision is, needs those headers and anchor points to say, okay, I'm moving through the page in a logical way. And when you skip a header or you put in another H1, I literally don't know, am I halfway up the page? Am I in a different page? We know what happens. Um, and the more frustrated a user gets, the more likely they're not going to engage with the content. So something to keep in mind. non whack get start term navigation toolbar sbct no com saved bookmarks tool accessibility demo bad page so now we'll try lists again no next list come on skip to navigation tool collapse Ac list pick arc up a mainland so that's one thing i want to also mention that your choice of browser and software can sometimes conflict. Um, sometimes it can change, you know, down to a rele one release away or from when you knew it was good, it can change. So if you're getting some weirdness uh, from a screen reader, it might be um, software incompatibility. NVDA is very, it's free and it's very honest because it's not quite as tricky and specialized as JAWS. JAWS might give you some false positives that something is gonna work, but NVDA is a good minimum and then it's more bare bones and it's freeware. So just something to keep in mind when you're working through your pages. List with eight items, bullet Washington Association of Community and Technical Colleges. List with one items, white bullet president's assistance for list with three items, white bullet purchasing affairs council, POC. List with one items, white bullet read more. So now what's that read more about? Like I, we're in a long technical list. And I have no idea where that link goes to. Am I going to click it? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, but there's so many links here to explore that that literally adds, you know, value that takes away valuable time from your from your reader. No next list. Okay, so now we're going to go back into the table and see what that looks like for that proper markup. X web get browser tabs. 100 and save bookmarks accessibility demo bad page sbct no next table skip to con con pay up up main landmark the a to z in table with six rows and four columns row one column one application row two link high demand funds program row three link perkins leadership block grant so what sounds like, oh, that sounds right. It sounds fine. But I don't know where, I don't know what, what, like what am I actually um, reading about? I don't see the application point. Um, Column two, April 15th. Uh, that date means nothing to me. Is that a due date? Is that a release date? Um, I don't know what I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm listening to. Column three continuous through May 31st, 2022. So what's continuous application? Deadline, the due date, what well, I don't know. No. Oh. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, that something that seems simple is this like a table, and it seems like it sort of works. You have to think about if someone has no vision, no visual reference at all, what are they gonna hear? Great. And I want to come back over to our assistive technology or alternate format image here, which this reminder, this image is mentioned. Um right above the image itself. So therefore it's relevant, therefore you want all text. And we had nothing. So now I go, okay, well, what's, what's so important about this image? Is it important? Am I missing something? Um, and if content's important, you don't want to call your client or your reader to miss it. Color should not. Another example here is we have check marks. Um, so if these were important, I wouldn't know they're here. Um, another bad, another bad example of alt, um, alt text is using like a file name and putting a file name, like red check or rain check. Okay, but I don't know what they're for. 
Are they decorative? I don't know. So that's my presentation um, using MBDA to go through a web page. This is, as I said, there's several different um, screen readers that other AT people might use, such as uh, magnification or text to speech. That's just one way someone's going to access your page and why it's so important to be accessible. Um, Monica, do we have time for questions? Hey, Sean, thank you so much for that awesome demo. We're lucky to have you here with us today. And yes, we have uh, time for maybe even three questions. So does anyone have a question for Sean about using a screen reader or anything you saw today or heard today in our demo? Or any comments? I'm curious if anyone in the room today, if this was their first time experiencing a screen reader uh, navigating and reading content out loud. I, uh, so Sean showed us that NVDA reader, I jumped uh, and I went and installed it quick and it was kind of cool. It was uh, talking to me right from the start, telling me what it was doing on the install. So it's just like, yeah, it, it's, it's really cool to, to use those tools. Yeah, I, I have it muted just because it, it'll talk over me. So I'm, 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 my hand is basically on the control key. So if you, if you guys are ever playing with NVDA, you want to stop talking, just hold control. Because if I would have not had control down, it would have really been talking over me the whole time. So yeah, it will, um, it will give you navigational and landmarks um, throughout the operating system. So you can actually just kind of mouse over things and see what they say. Thanks, Paul, for your comment. I'm excited to hear you downloaded NVDA today. Alyssa, I see your hands up, so feel free to take it away. Yep. Hi, Sean, this is Alyssa. I just have a quick question for you. Um, did you slow the audio down for us so that we could understand it more? Or do you usually listen to it a little faster? Because I've seen screen reader demos before where it was going so fast, I couldn't even um, understand what it was saying. And this one, I this time I was, I, I mean, it was a lot easier to understand. So I was just curious what speed you typically listen to yours at. So yeah, so as a, as a you know, as, a, as you know, um, uh, being upfront about it, I tend to prefer magnification with some text to speech for my preferred method. So I use Zoom text or magnification with a little bit of speech here and there, especially mm -hmm. for long documents. But as a screen reader user, I'm not as um, like I mentioned. The user that gets really proficient tends to need less speech and they tend to make it faster and faster and faster and faster. So I definitely had to slow it down for me because I was trying to, I'm trying to hear, you know, feedback too. And I knew that I'm going to be honest. Um, the, the default voices for most screeners are pretty bad. Um, NVDA has this weird, I mean, not weird. I should be nice about it. It's a very specific English speaking man. And he's kind of robotic and English accent at the same time. And I can't understand him. So I am, um, if you guys are looking for better voices in NBA, um, if you go in and switch to uh, the voice to uh, Microsoft, I think it's sound API five, I use David and I slow him down to about a rate of 50. So yes, Alyssa, I did slow him down quite a bit because they, they really default to a high speed. And if you're, that's, that's what you learn on, that's what you work on every day, it's fine. But as a user who is just occasionally working in that area, I can't keep up. Thanks, you know, Sean. Yeah. Nanette, I see that you've got your hand raised. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the screen reader demo was really interesting. Um, I could feel myself getting overwhelmed just trying to listen to the normal page, let alone um, the bad page. Um, but I decided to go to a couple of our pages on the website and tab through. And I was wondering, like on the Becoming a Student page and several of our other pages, there's the little um, image squares and they have an ellipse on the side. Mm -hmm. And the ellipse, when you're tabbing through, says more. Mm -hmm. Does the screen reader pick up more? And wouldn't that be like click here? Or does yeah, the screen reader it'll, say it's an ellipse? It'll, 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 to know the screen reader, like if you if I was to slow down and go through the actual like the the collapse lists on top, the navigation list, it will say like more or become you know like or more or uh, next or you know some it'll give you some indication. If I was being you know more a little more technical, I could you can navigate through those. 
It just takes a little more work. Um, you also get that when you go through the footer, when you go through the graphic links, um, it'll tell you what the graphic is and where it's going to go. Oh, okay. that, tend, that tends to be how someone would navigate through. They would find what they would, you know, get through the get through the menu, find out where it's going, and then they would, you know, either hit return or um, click to go through to the next page. But yeah, it will um, generally pick most of that up. I guess that I have to be say generally because every screen reader is a little different, and um, some screen readers do some some things better than others. Um, NVDA is pretty good as long as you're compliant, but sometimes it just misses some things. That's why I like to test with both JAWS and NVDA when I have a chance. Um, for an example, I was proofing a, a PowerPoint for a colleague of mine, and JAWS said it was fine, and NVDA said it wasn't. So um, that just gives you some perspective on, you know, different screen readers have different abilities. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Annette. I'm glad to hear that you went on a page and started tabbing through to look at the tab order of some of our web pages. Um, we have time for just one more question so, or comment. So if there's anyone out there in the audience who has a question or a comment, uh, feel free to raise your hand or unmute your mic. All righty. Well, um, thanks again so much, Sean, for your demo and for sharing some time with us today. We're, we're lucky to have you. Um, so um, I'm going to pull up my uh, share screen and PowerPoint slide here again and get us moving into part or section four with Greg. So just give me a moment. Okay, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, I hope you're having some fun and there's a little bit of, uh, of information here for everyone, no matter what skill level or exposure to accessibility you came here with today. Um, we've made it to our last and final section of our training today, section four with Greg Campbell, Web Development Basics. Um, just a note for everyone in the room today, um, this section is perhaps our most technical section and it really is geared to uh, the developers in the room. So if you're not a developer and you're a, you're a page content editor, you're more than welcome to stay and hang on and listen. And hopefully you're gonna learn some interesting things. Um, but if you feel like this section might not be um, you know, your speed, you are, welcome to leave now as well. It's totally up to you. Just wanted to put that out there. Um, there in the Google Doc link that I put in the chat in our materials and resources, there are links to um, the materials that the site that Greg created for his demo today. Um, and then he's gonna be touching on um, REN alerts a little bit. If you want to read and learn more, um, about ARIA Alert Roll or ARIA Atomic. We've provided some links in our presentation and our resource um, Google Doc as well that you can access on your own after today. Um, so these are the topics that Greg is gonna discuss with us today. He's gonna talk a little bit about the bootstrap framework and the use of proper and semantic HTML. He's gonna talk a little bit about alerts in ARIA, He's going to show you basic form um, layout and input labels to make sure that screen reader technology or other assistive technology can navigate and input information into a form accessibly. And also he's going to talk a little bit about modals. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Greg. Let me check real quick and see if there's anything in the chat. Nope. Nanette just saying, thank you. Okay, Greg, I'm gonna mute myself and hand it over to you. Greg, if you're talking, you are still on mute, my friend. Okay, it won't let me share because somebody else is sharing. Um, I do see your screen share. 
Okay, let me try it one more time. Okay. Can you see the site? Yep, you see your site. It uh, has. Oh, okay. I was expecting it to come up on the other side. Yep. Yep. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, is um, talk a little about frameworks, um, like a, a semantics, um, basic HTML. Uh, we're going to show you some alerts, some modals, and some, some basic forms. Um, all of the sites that I do, I use a framework. It's called the Bootstrap Framework. It's probably one of the most popular ones out there. There are several besides Bootstrap. There is um, Foundation, Skeleton, Materialize, which is the one that Google used, which was just kind of a flat look. Um, there's like three or four, maybe five other, uh, other frameworks out there. And a framework is pretty much the way to go. If you're doing a lot of sites and you're not using a framework, you're probably reinventing the wheel each time you create a site because the framework will give you something that it's a nice standardized look, feel. Um, you can have different colors and different themes in the framework, but the way the site works and the way that you create it is pretty much going to be standardized. So you get your work done a lot faster. Um, they're easy to use. There's a lot of um, um, how to's for the bootstrap. Um, it uses the, the grid framework for um, positioning and the grid framework, if you're not familiar with it is what newspapers use when they originally started doing um, typeface, you know, um, setting up content in a logical order. So that's what Bootstrap use. Um, most of the big, bigger frameworks use a grid format and Bootstrap uses 12 separate columns. Um, semantic HTML, um, basically HTML5, oops, sorry about that, HTML5 um, on its own is accessible. It's when we get into doing special things like um, pop-ups, tool tips, um, you know, special like drop downs, big forms. When we start using that, that's when we started having problems with accessibility. But the screen readers or any of the accessible technology that someone may use understands HTML. So for instance, if you have um, a paragraph, put it in a P tag um, because it understands that that's a group of text that's all together. If you have a list, um, put it in a, a list tag, a UL, which is a unordered or an OL, which is an ordered list. So it'll add the one, two, three, four. There's another one. And this is what I have in this one. It's called a definition list. So you have um, it's a DL tag and it has a DT tag to start out, which is like a, um, um, the top, the, the header, and then there's a, 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 the body part. So and it automatically does this bolding right here. So these are tied together. So it knows like, here's the uh, um, definition, or excuse me, here's the um, title. And then this is the definition for that title. And when a screen reader goes to read this, it understands, okay, block quote, and it's going to automatically go down to this because it knows that these two are tied. And that's semantic HTML. Um, there's another one that's that we use, and it's called a div. Uh, it's a definition tag. And this is how we use um, to create sections of, um, of a page. And Bootstrap uses this quite a bit, and that's how it defines its columns. Um, if you really want to get into it um, later on we can have another um another uh, show and tell on this on how to use bootstrap so if you have uh, a basic site use the html as it's supposed to be used um, don't use things like um like on this example a block quote when you use is a tag and what it does is it's got it's automatically styled so that it indents all the text. So if you want to indent text, don't use a block quote unless it's actually a quote. Um, if you need to indent stuff, you know, that's what uh, CSS is for. Okay, so next, alerts. 
when I originally started creating websites, alerts were one of the big problems with accessibility. Um, showing an alert is no problem, but getting a screen reader, especially a screen reader to notice it um, was a problem. So I started getting into the ARIA um, keywords and such, and I found something that worked. And what I'm using, well, let me show you what it looks like. This is going to be, a, I'm going to call the OK alert, and it pops up right here. And I, this is a standard that I do on all of my sites. So if I have an error, some kind of error message, it shows up here. And all this is, it's a div tag. And I have the a role of alert. Now, I could have used something called ARIA Live Assertive because they're basically both the same. Um, what it does is that when there is text, let's see, let me explain this a little better. There's a div tag in here and then I have a literal. And this literal is basically a placeholder holder. So when I have um, text I can put into this placeholder uh, programmically, it will show up. And so this has changed. And the role alert um, notices that. And you have this, what they call area atomic. Area atomic makes sure that the screen reader stops what it, or the, the browser stops what it's doing and announces to the screen reader that hey, something has changed here. So what happens um, with role alert, like I said, it's, it's like um, ARIA assertive, which basically shows the, um, the text or, or the, 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 the content. Um, role alert also, when it makes attention to the screen reader, it says alert. Um, ARIA live will just won't say anything. It'll just say, you know, there's a new text like that. And I'll have an example of this with the modals. So when I click on this, it shows um, this has changed to this. So there's a change. And what happens, it'll say roll alert, or excuse me, it'll just say alert, then a new alert shown. Okay. And that's the text that is shown inside there. If you notice that there's an icon on here, and that's just for people that, you know, visual users because I use what we call it ARIA hidden equals true. And what that does is that it, it tells the screen reader to just skip it over. Uh, don't worry about it, don't, you know, just ignore it. Um, if you've noticed also, see, in, let's see, yeah, okay. Um, different colors and they don't, um, they don't tell, you know, the screens don't show up or the colors don't show up when the alert is noticed or notified. But that's why I have the icons. Um, it's just a look thing. So you notice that one is the checkbox and there's the, like a, an alert sign. Um, then when I do clear alert, it clears, it says alert and then there's nothing there. So it ends up looking like this down here. So there's no more text in there. And what if I do this? It populates that inside there, and then the screen reader will announce alert, new alert shown, okay. And you have the link to this site, so you can see how I'm doing that. Um, one other thing I wanna show, you notice how this is jumping up and down? It goes up to the top and this one drops all the way down. I have this, uh, it's some JavaScript that I use because some of the pages that I use are fairly long. You know, you got to scroll through them. And since this is at the top, an, an alert or a screen reader will announce it, whether it's you see it or not. But for the visual people, I want to be able to say, go back up, it sends it right up to the top of that page so they can see what's going on. And this right here just shows you, you know, the, the positioning that I can do. And there's a couple of, um, accordions up here. You can look here and you can see uh, this is how I call it. And these are the JavaScript functions that I use or examples. <clears throat> and for those really into the code, this is the class that I'm using. When I, um, when I call do a button click, I call this class and it's, it's pretty well um, commented. So you can figure it out. It's not that big of a deal, uh, not very hard to figure out. Um, next, 
modals. Modals and pop-ups are pretty close to the same. A modal is basically going to be more of a form that you fill out or um, that you want to make sure is read. A pop-up is more um, a notification. Um, I don't use pop-ups because they're they're not um, they're not you can't really style them with a modal I can do it's basically a, like a page that it, that is thrown up into a window and we have two different kinds of modals we have the standard modal it'll pop up um, it puts a an overlay the way I have it set up anyways I can make this totally black if I wanted to or make it you know no overlay at all it's just the way it's styled but when you hit when you call the modal, um, it shows up here, and the standard modal, if you click outside of it, it will go away. There's another one called a static modal, and this is, uh, it looks the same, except when you click on the outside of it, it does not go away. So I use this type if I have, for instance, um, a form that I want somebody to fill out, or they're working on a form and they need to add, figure out some information or fill out some uh, information prior to, to it. Then I'll have a form here. And then once they get that filled out, they'll submit it and then I'll close it. Um, the, the code in the back end on the code behind, um, it's basically a giant div and it uses the ARIA live assertive. And so, unlike the role, it's not going to say anything. So when I call this, the first thing it's do is it gets, um, it gets um, focus on this and it'll read the heading that's on there. And then if you tab through, it'll read like there's a close button here, then it'll read the content or the form that you have in there. Then it'll read like there's a close button and then it'll just keep looping around in here because this is, this is the focus of the uh, screen reader at the time. Um, the actual modal itself is right here. Um, I have that wrapped up in the div because that's the only way that you can make sure that it is announced when it pops up. And this is a basic uh, bootstrap modal. This is um, part of the whole um, framework. So there's that's what, another reason for using a framework is you have all these components that you can use that have already been proven. They, they, we, people know they work. Um, Bootstrap, one of the deals about it is that they make sure that everything is accessible and it's um, responsive. So, and I'll show you that later on about the responsibility, about how they're responsive. Um, so that's pretty much it with modals. Very easy to hook up. Um, I thought I had it on here, but I don't. I can show you on this paging right here. Um, this is the button handler that I would use. I would use I'd register this, and I would have a function down here that calls out to open up a modal. Um, the modal there's uh, Bootstrap has a, a JavaScript file, and in that you can you can define jumping all over the place here, I would use this ID. And so it knows um, that the you would, you would attach modal to that. And when you uh, use the JavaScript function, you just say show and it automatic, the JavaScript automatically knows how to pull that up, apply the styles and you have a nice little modal. So it works pretty good. And again, it's accessible. Um, basic forms. Um, like I said, Bootstrap has the grid system, <clears throat> and that's how these are determined. Um, I don't. I didn't do it here. I did it over here. Um, you can see this form right here. Um, this is probably about two columns wide, and this is probably about ten columns wide. And that makes a difference because, well, well I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> Sorry, let me uh, get back to where I was. Basic form, this is the basic, um, a basic bootstrap form layout. Um, you have labels 
basic labels and a basic input field. Um, anytime you have a, um, an input field, you need to have a label. Um, that label will have a, an attribute called for. And inside that attribute, you put the ID of your input. And what that does is it ties this label to this form. So when a screen reader comes back or comes onto this page, it'll read this and it'll automatically know that this is attached to that. So it'll when you jump into it, when you tab into it, it'll come to here, but it will read email address. And if you notice down here, there's something down here too. And so when you tab into this one, it'll read email address. We'll never share your email with anyone else. And the reason it knows that is because I use another ARIA tag. It's called ARIA described by. Um, so I have a, a little tag in here called small. And again, here's that semantic HTML. Um, it's a styled basically like a div that's been styled or a span tag that's been styled. It has an ID of email help. Um, the class in here is that's muted. It's the way that the text will look. And then it has the text. And you notice that it's, a, it's, it's smaller because that's what small does. But this ARIA described by is telling um, the screen reader that this is describing this. So when you tab into here, it'll read email address. We'll never share your email address with anyone, anyone else. So that's kind of nice. Um, same thing with password. Um, it'll jump into here. It'll say password. Um, same with the checkbox. Um, it's kind of nice if, if for people that are have some visual issues, um, especially with um, if they're on like a tablet or a phone, that they some of the checkboxes are really small, but they don't have to check the checkbox. All they have to do is check the wording for the checkbox and it'll check and uncheck it. Because as you can see down here, we have a label and it's called example check one in the four, where is it at? Yeah, right here. Example check one, and here's the four on the label. So this label is now tied to this input field. Um, what else? Okay, buttons. Don't use, um, Bootstrap has a button class, it's called DTN, and you can give it different colors and such. Like for instance, um, these have a, like a BTN button um, success. This is a button dash error, and this is a button dot dash warning. So there's different colors that you can use. Back to the form. Um, don't style um, links or span tags as buttons unless you really have no choice on it. I understand that sometimes, um, especially on like I heard CTC link, they're using JavaScript links and they're styling them as buttons. So that can cause problems. Um, a lot of times you can take a button and you can call a JavaScript method. So you, then you're using an actual button and then you're calling the script instead of having a, a, a link styled as a button. Because the screen readers will, they don't always read a link as a button properly. So when you're tabbing into it, sometimes the your uh, enter button will not submit the button. Um, so another one I hear is another part of the form. As you notice, this is you have different types of forms you can do. This one has the labels up on top. This one has the labels on the side. Um, one of the things about Bootstrap or in a lot of the frameworks is that they are what they call mobile first. And basically mobile first means that anything that you have, like we have a big screen here. So if I go ahead and drop this down into a mobile size, you see how this kind of, this is that same one that was on the side. See now it's, it's stacked. And that's, that happens because they're using this area right here is maybe two columns high or two columns wide and this one's 10. 
So what happens, you have a, an ability in the bootstrap framework to say, okay, um, first I have to tell you about media queries. Uh, media queries are basically as the screen is a certain size. As it gets smaller and bigger, um, those are called media queries. So you can have an extra small would be like a very narrow mobile. Small would be like some of the newer, bigger mobiles. Uh, a medium would be maybe like a small tablet. A large could be, a, a, you know, an older screen or older or a flat screen or a, or a, um, a laptop. And, uh, and we have, there's also extra large and that could be some of the new widescreen monitors that we have. Um, inside there's built in these pre-built media queries. So you can have, um, for instance, when you're calling on Bootstrap, you have, you call it out like column dash SM, which is small dash in how many um, columns you wanna use. So for instance, on this one, it would probably be column dash, um, probably large dash two. Um, but you can also add column dash extra small, which is the excess um, dash 12. So when the screen gets down to that media query of extra small, it'll suddenly take up 12 columns. So what happens if this takes 12, 12 columns, It'll, these will start stacking up. So this will stack on top of that, that will stack on top of that. And so you still have your, your nice form, but everything is starting to stack up when you get these smaller and smaller sites. And this is really helpful because a lot of the sites that, that we create, they, you know, we look at them on the screen, but there are a lot of people are using laptops, they're using tablets, and believe it or not, a lot of people are using some of our bigger sites with their phone. And because of that, because we're using a bootstrap, these sites are actually usable still on a phone. And I think that's it. Um, my email address is at the bottom of this if you have any questions. And I'm going to stop sharing now, stop talking because I can't, I need something in my mouth. 